Neumann Warwick, and I'm going to speak about how manufacturing constraints can enable manufacturing efficiencies. Um, briefly, I've spent my career in manufacturing and operations. Uh, my first job was working in a small factory in Nagano Prefecture in Japan. Uh, we were making brushless DC spindle motors, and I was a line operator there. That was my initiation. Uh, since then, I've worked in uh, Fortune 500 companies and in startups. Uh, notably, I uh, set up operations for Pure Digital. We were the makers of the flip video camera. Uh, we ramped that up to millions of units, and then we sold the flip business to Cisco Systems. Cisco took the flip video camera and the Linksys router business and put that into one division. It was about a billion dollars in revenue, and uh, I got to run engineering and operations for that business unit, Cisco Consumer Products. About uh, seven years ago, I started on tap with 25 people. We provide strategic and tactical expertise in operations and sales. Okay, uh, so let me get a sense as to who's in the room with a show of hands. How many here are in engineering? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Lots of engineering, fabulous, thank you. How many in operations? All right, not bad, you can hold your own. Uh, how many are in a startup? Okay, great, more than I expected. And uh, how many are in high volume production today? Right. Uh, if, if your uh, final assembly test and pack out is happening in China, it might look something like this. Um, how many of you believe that manufacturing automation is in your future? With a show of hands. Um, and, and how many have some automation or, or robotics on the line today? And one last question with a show of hands. How many have a fully automated line that they're working on? Fully automated. Couple, couple of people. Okay. So the first, uh, the first time I saw a fully automated line a lights out, fully automated line was in the 1990s. It was at a company called MKE, uh, a Japanese manufacturing company in Shikoku, Japan. They were, they were our CM. I was with uh, Quantum Corporation. We were building disk drives uh, here in Milpitas, our own factory, and we had um, a relationship with uh, MKE. They built our high volume drives. Here's a photo of a high volume drive. You can see the platter. Um, it rests on top of the brushless DC spindle motor, the recording head, the actuator. This is a complex electromechanical assembly. MKE was able to build more than a million in the first month of production and then ramp from there in the 1990s. So I would submit to you that's manufacturing efficiency. How do you do that? You do it, I think, through constraints. I'm going to advance the, this idea of constraints today. Uh, and for the engineers in the room, I hope that it makes it uh, more clear to you why operations can be such a pain to work with. And for the ops people in the room, I hope this is a useful framework for thinking about the work that we do. So these constraints should be familiar to you. Uh, we try to lock down the manufacturing process, uh, the, the bill of material, the uh, approved vendor list. What I mean by locking down the manufacturing process and these other steps, what I mean by locking something down is in the case of the manufacturing process, for example, at some point you qualify the line and then you, you don't want your manufacturer to make any changes right, that aren't authorized, that aren't understood, that aren't tested appropriately and signed off on. So if you're an established company uh, with a mature supply chain, 
it's a different, how you manage these constraints uh, is different than if you're in a startup or if you're in a company that's setting up a new supply chain and uh, bringing up a new CM. Or around the bomb and the ABL, for example. Right? If, you're uh, if your supply chain is mature and all or most of the suppliers you're using are companies you've worked with before, then it's relatively easy. Those suppliers, they understand your expectations, they understand how to do business with your company, they've demonstrated performance over time, you go back to them again. If you're setting up an entirely new supply chain, bringing up a, a new CM, there's a lot more to do to figure out, can these suppliers really meet your technical requirements? Can they get to your cost targets? And oh, by the way, how do we figure out if they can scale? Can they do a million a month in the first month of production? There's a lot to get to to get at that. So let me talk about some of the constraints that are sometimes missed, like locking down sub-tier suppliers. What I mean by uh, sub-tier supplier is um, suppliers of <laughs> sub-assemblies, of components, potentially even driving all the way back to suppliers of raw material. So you, in order to, to get to high manufacturing efficiencies, that has to all get locked down. When do you do it? Especially if you're setting up a new supply chain, launching a new product. Often it's done after the start of MassPro, and sometimes that's too late. I want to illustrate with uh, this first example. The first war story is uh, a company I worked with that experienced battery problems. So they launched this product, a consumer electronics product, to great fanfare, fabulous press, great reviews, in production, ramping for several months, and now suddenly, battery problems. Um, it came up, it came to light with users having trouble charging the device. They try to charge it and it wouldn't charge, or it indicated that it charged, but then when they went to use it, it wouldn't hold the charge and it was out of batteries again. And their user frustrations mounted and our frustrations mounted. There was a lot of work done in uh, root cause failure analysis. And, um, and what we found, let me see where I am. Okay. Um, and what we found in the root cause failure analysis was that a sub-tier supplier had made a change. The, the supplier that made the battery contact had made a change. But it wasn't, it didn't stop there. It wasn't the battery contact supplier's change that got us. They had changed um, uh, suppliers of the coating for the battery contact. And that changed the electrical performance and the charging of the device sufficiently to create a terrible user experience. The company had initially had four and five star reviews on Amazon for this product. Those uh, reviews plummeted to an average of 3%. Um, just to illustrate the, the impact on revenue in our experience, uh, going from four stars on Amazon to three stars on Amazon can be as much as a 50% drop in unit sales. People don't want to buy three-star products if there's a four-star or a five-star product there. So uh, the company was spending a lot of marketing, on, on, had, had large distribution for the product, was spending a lot of marketing. They decided not to continue to spend marketing on this product that now had a bad review. And they chose to, uh, to cancel the product, to discontinue the product. So all of that cost of bringing that new product out, all of that effort, all of that tool, all of that was wasted. Here's another example of a constraint that gets missed, and that is uh, rework. This is, also, um, this is also particularly tricky if you're uh, bringing up a new supply chain or a new CM because there's so much to do all at once. When you're in an NPI, if you're thinking about rework at all, you're going to think, oh, I'll deal with that later. I'll deal with that after we get to Mass Pro, uh, and that too can sometimes be too late. So here's the second war story. Uh, we had a, a, a client with a successful consumer electronics product that started getting reports from the field, uh, units overheated. 
consumers concerned about these units overheating and, and starting to send some units back. Um, but, it, but the product was very successful and, um, and it was a low single digit percentage problem. It turned into a uh, it turned into a catastrophe for the company when some of the units that came back showed that plastic was melting and there was smoke, and that of course meant right catastrophic failure, risk of fire. Uh, the company decided to do a product recall. The root cause failure analysis was traced back to a sub tier supplier who made a change. It wasn't a change that they made in their manufacturing process where it might have been caught more easily. It was an ad hoc rework loop that they just decided to do on their own that nobody knew about. And we only found out about it through the field failures. My question is, whose fault is that? Often, you know, I'll hear ops people say, well, I told the CM that they're going to have to qualify rework. And they didn't do it. Right? It's the CM's fault. And my point to the ops people in the room is, that's not good enough. Right? You have to get out in front of it. You need to anticipate there will be rework. And set expectations at the factory at every level as to how you want that handled. And then you've got to be in the factory regularly to know what's going on. This is the, 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 uh, the last example in this series. Um, I'll call it the uh, black swan example. It's, uh, it's in the category of random shit happens. And I'm going to uh, ask you to, to uh, try and guess what happened here, what caused this particular failure mode. The example is a disk drive. We had field failures. So if any of you are involved in enterprise sales, enterprise businesses, you'll know that you know, field failures get treated a lot differently than for consumer electronics. Um, our, dis our customers, customers of our disk drives were you know, selling those to computer companies that sold them to consumers. And now you've got a consumer somewhere that, that uh, can't access their drive, that's lost critical data, and, um, and is freaking out. We found that there's contamination in the units. So production had been stable. And we thought everything was locked down, right? All the constraints were in place. We went back and checked. What changed? What can account for the sudden appearance of uh, contamination that's causing the drives to, to fail? It wasn't, they, they didn't change anything on the AVL. They didn't change the bomb. There was no changes to the, to the, to the uh, manufacturing process that wasn't accounted for. There was no uh, rework involved. Sub-tier suppliers were locked down. Any guesses as to what we found? What could have caused that contamination in that sealed unit that was assembled in a class 10 clean room? Virtual leak. Sorry, say again? Virtual leak. Virtual leak. Interesting. Could be. Maintenance, Maintenance problem, maybe. Operator training. Say again? Operator training. Operator training. All of those, I'm sure, have, have led to these kind of, of issues. Here's what we found. A farmer next to the platter, the, the factory that made the disc, the platter uh, manufacturer, had changed to a different pesticide. And somehow that pesticide got into the ventilation system of the platter factory. And even though that, those platters were coated in a clean room environment, the pesticides overwhelmed the systems, didn't get caught by the sensors and caused the contamination which resulted in millions of dollars of liability up and down the supply chain. So coming back to constraints, you can do all these things uh, that we talked about. You can lock all this down, and it still may not be enough. I'll, I'll, I'll argue it's not enough to be able to do a million units in, the, in a month, in month one. Uh, you also need. DFM. I want to talk about DFM as a constraint on product design, with apologies to the engineers in the room. I'll illustrate it with this example from uh, my MKE experience. I mentioned earlier MKE is our 
uh, Japanese CM when we were building drives. And um, the way that, that uh, MKE worked with our engineering team is that ops and engineering were literally on the same team. I can talk about what that, what that means, but, but physically together um, and, and measured on the same set of metrics, literally on the same team, which meant that, that uh, ops input and DFM input happened right from product inception. And of course there's conflicts. Engineer, engineering has a certain way that they want to uh, implement the design and the factory uh, has other ideas. So conflicts will emerge. What management made clear was that, that um, at the end of the day, the factory would get what they needed. Engineering had to figure out how to get the factory what they needed because only that way would we achieve the time to market goals and the time to volume goals that the company had. And so ops uh, set the rules at, around supplier selection and DFM. And, and my rhetorical question for the ops people in the room is, do you wield that kind of influence? So let me be clear. I, I'm not suggesting that this is the right model. I don't think it can work in most companies and it may not yield the best results. But the key point here, what this model did do is it put engineering and operations on the same page, on the same team. And I think that's the key. Too often today, uh, ops and engineering operate as different teams. Even if you're not completely different silos, you're different teams and you're, you've got different priorities and you're measured differently. And much to my exasperation, I can, I can uh, identify companies where on the same product launch, engineering can be viewed as successful and ops can be viewed as having failed or vice versa on the same launch. In this world where ops and engineering are at odds, uh, ops always loses and manufacturing efficiencies suffer. I can remember when I was a, a young ops guy standing in my GM's office and witnessing a shouting match. I was horrified. The VP of operations and the VP of engineering were screaming at each other. And the VP of ops said, the product's not done. I'm not taking it to mass pro. Uh, the yields are too low. And the VP of engineering says, the product is done. It turns to the GM and, and makes the statement, if we don't roll the engineering team off this product now and get them started on the next product, then the next product development on your roadmap will be late. And that sealed the deal. And so the GM turns to the VP of Ops and says, you're going to Mass Pro, too bad, get it done. When Ops and engineering are at odds, Ops always loses and manufacturing efficiencies suffer. The answer, again, I believe, is that Ops and engineering need to be on the same team in order to, to um, in order for ops to be able to influence the design, and uh, and that can only happen if ops is capable, of course, and that what that means is that they can demonstrate that they're adding value. Uh, I have a disclaimer. I've been talking about. Um, DFM as a constraint on the design, I want to point out that money can unlock that constraint. And if you're Apple or you have a CapEx like Apple, then um, you can have the manufacturing processes and the manufacturing automation meet the design and the design intent rather than subjugating the design to the limitations of the manufacturing processes that exist and the robotics that exist. Similarly, uh, I think that technology may unlock automation constraints uh, as robotics become more flexible and smarter.
So I'll uh, leave you with three takeaways. The first is, uh, for, for the ops people in the room, good DFM is your responsibility. It drives me crazy when I hear ops people say, you know what, the CM didn't provide good DFM on this, this round. It's, it's ops's job to ensure that the constraints are in place at an appropriate level and that the, that the DFM is, is meaningful for the, for the company and for the product. Second takeaway. Don't assume that you can generalize from your experience. And I want to say this especially for, for people in, in large companies, in established companies with mature supply chains. You may be in a company that has a large spend with your CM and your supply chain, that has a large capex. If you move to a startup or a mid-sized company, you're setting up a new supply chain, you're bringing up a new CM, what worked before may not apply. And the third takeaway is this, that it hinges, that success hinges on teamwork. And so if your company is doing well and you're an ops and you're killing it, remember that's happening because of the great people you're working with in the other functions. Remember to thank your engineering and uh, sales and marketing uh, colleagues because it only works if, if you're firing on all cylinders. Uh, and when that happens, it's, it's something special. It doesn't happen every day. One question, does anybody have a burning uh, question? Okay. Uh, if, uh, oh, I yes. Have you tried to uh, leverage learning from other industries on how they maintain constraints and processes like Coca-Cola, like food consistency, or like medical practices being like consistent and safe, uh, those kind of things? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, it's a great question. You know, can, can we leverage uh, what's happening in other industries. Um, uh, and so the short answer is, is yes. Um, we're involved now with, um, at, at ONTAP, we're involved uh, in enterprise uh, projects, industrial, uh, medical devices, robotics, in addition to uh, consumer electronics. So I, I see a lot of value in pulling from different fields. We haven't done you know, beverages. Um, uh, I, I think food safety is, is super interesting to me. Uh, the other comment I'll make on that is that uh, I love I love finding ops people that have a, a diverse background, an eclectic background that come from various industries because um, there's more you know creative juice you can insert into your organization. Uh, feel free to call me or email me, and you can submit your questions as Anna mentioned earlier. Uh, 